1997, fresh off a decade of success at Saturday Night Live and spin-off films like Wayne's World and Wayne's World 2, as well as the cult classic movie So I Married an Axe Murderer, Canadian comedian and diehard Toronto Maple Leafs fan, because that matters, Mike Myers embarked on what was perhaps the most ambitious project of his career to that point, a campy and crude parody of the 1960s spy genre. Think Sean Connery era James Bond, which was called Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery. Yeah, baby, yeah! In the film, which ended up spawning two sequels of diminishing quality, Myers played a whole cast of memorable characters built around the premise of an oversexed idiot spy who had been cryogenically frozen in the 1960s, now being thawed out and put back into service in the 1990s, to foil the plot of his arch nemesis, who also spent 30 years in cryosleep, Dr. Evil. And although the movie's protagonist was the titular Austin Powers, it was the equally buffoonish antagonist, Dr. Evil, that won the hearts of filmgoers and made this series into a bit of a classic in the so-bad-that-it's-good genre of comedies. Dr. Evil was a maniacal, emotional, charismatic, and quippy villain who stole every single scene he was in. He was over the top in all the right ways and just stupid enough to be thwarted by the equally obtuse protagonist time and again. He had a penchant for overly complex and elaborate plans that would provide the hero just enough time, space, and room to maneuver so that he could be undone by his own hand time and time again. I'm going to place him in an easily escapable situation involving an overly elaborate and exotic death. And he, in every film in the series, was the most entertaining character by a country mile. Now, it's hard to read the Book of Esther without feeling the same things about the chief antagonist in that story, Haman. He's quirky, a bit eccentric, a little unhinged, definitely over the top. He thinks too much of himself, concocts needlessly convoluted plans to cut down his enemies, and then ends up being undone by his own self-assuredness and the very plans that he put into motion. So why am I comparing Haman to Dr. Evil, and not to say Dr. No or Ernst Stavro Blofeld or any of the other famous blonde villains that quite obviously inspired Myers' iconic antagonist? Well, I do that because Haman, like Dr. Evil, is not a serious antagonist. He's a parody. He's a joke. And the reader is in on the comedy, even if all the characters take themselves and their situations very, very seriously. It's been noted by many scholars over the ages that if you don't laugh at the Book of Esther at some point when reading it, then you have, haven't actually understood the Book of Esther. Because this story is funny. It's raucous, it's irreverent, and a bit bawdy in tone. It's genre is that one commentator used to describe the book is burlesque. And if you're made uncomfortable with that word and the overtly sexual connotations which go along with it sometimes, well, then you should know what it actually means. Which can only mean, it's time for Chris's Word of the Day. Burlesque is a type of artistic composition which, for the sake of laughter, vulgarizes lofty material or treats ordinary material with mock dignity. Jewish scholar Adele Berlin describes Esther with these words. She says, The lofty material that Esther vulgarizes is the Persian Empire and the Persian court. The normally sedate affairs of state, the carefully organized and controlled legal system, the efficient postal system, the impressive accumulation of wealth indicative of a successful empire, all of the achievements most praiseworthy in the Persian Empire are turned into a burlesque of Persian court life. 
caricatured by ludicrous edicts delivered by speeding messengers, a foppish royal court with an endless hierarchy of officials, and a wooden adherence to nonsensical laws. A major policy decision, the annihilation of the Jews, is made casually, but a small domestic incident, Vashti's non-appearance at a party, becomes a crisis of state with all the bureaucratic trappings that can be mustered. In this way, we understand Esther to be a burlesque parody of, or a satire, if you will, of Persian court life for the purposes of getting some laughs while making a larger point. Again, centuries of prudish Christian seriousness about the Bible have robbed us in many ways of the ability to laugh when reading the scriptures, but trust me, that is exactly what the author of Esther wants us to do. Which is why I'm making a somewhat burlesque comparison today myself between Haman and Dr. Evil. Because I really believe that that is how we are supposed to view him when we read the story. Haman creates the most ineffective and ridiculous plot. He rolls the dice and walks away. It's effectively the same as setting a large laser in place to slowly advance and kill his victim, and then leaving the room to do something else, just trusting that with unsupervised time, the hero won't find a way to escape. I'm going to place him in an easily escapable situation involving an overly elaborate and exotic death. Haman's plan is so ridiculous that Mordecai and Esther are given the time, the resources, the opportunity to plot and scheme, to prepare and execute a plan to escape from Haman's trap, and then to do more than that, to turn the tables on the wicked man and give him and his kinsmen the fate that had been planned originally for them. And Haman, for his part, is none the wiser. What does he do? after the royal decree sets a date for the execution of the Jews in the distant future, he goes back to doing exactly what a comically inept villain would do. He gets drunk with the king, celebrating his evil plan. Cue the evil laughter. <laughs> so why is he like this? What's the rhetorical point of making Haman such a caricature in this story? How does it contain any redeeming value beyond cheap laughs? Well, in a moment here, Dave Parks is going to come and read us a passage from Esther chapter 3. And then I will return afterwards to start pulling back the curtain on the character of Haman to show you why he is more than he might appear to be on the surface. But to hear that, you're first going to have to wait. As Dave comes up, let's all stand together and give our attention to the reading of the word. And I'll be back. So why does Haman do it? What is his motivation? What's his backstory? What drives him towards his genocidal impulses? These are the sorts of questions that the postmodern mind and critic might ask of the story. But they're not the sort of questions that actually matter to this story or to the people who wrote it or received it. Haman is not a multi-dimensional character with feelings and hurts and a tragic and sympathetic backstory full of nuance that helps you understand why he might be so bad. Haman's just a bad guy who wants to be like the king. He fancies himself worthy of praise and exaltation and as such demands it from everyone who is beneath him because that's what bad guys do. It's as simple as that. And we can say that he models himself after Xerxes because of the way he deals with the offense when it's given to him. Do you remember back when we read chapter 1 how Xerxes reacted to Vashti's refusal to come and parade before his guests? What did Xerxes do? Well, we remember he threw a temper tantrum and issued a decree that not only was Vashti not allowed to do the very thing she had already decided not to do, but he also declared that all men were to be masters of their own households and that all women in the empire were commanded to respect their husbands. The exact thing he perceived Vashti didn't do to him. One woman offends him and his response is to issue an edict against all women as a result. Does this sound familiar at all? 
Haman effectively does the same thing in response to Mordecai refusing to bow before him. Instead of just dealing with the offending person, Haman got all upset and made a decree that punished all the Jews for Mordecai's act of disrespect. Now, there are heavy-handed parallels at work here. Why didn't Mordecai bow to Haman? Well, that's a matter of scholarly debate. Rabbinic Midrashic tradition has claimed, in some cases, that it was because Haman had a tattoo of a god on his chest, and as such, Mordecai was fulfilling the first commandment to not worship any other gods. But there's nothing in the text or historical documents to support that tradition, and most scholars agree that it just exists to make sense of a story element which, on its very own, makes very little sense. In the context of the story, what is probably intended here is to show the natural and inescapable enmity between these two men and all that they represent as characters. Now, I told you a couple weeks ago that Haman's th ethnicity as an Agagite was important to the story, as Agagite was shorthand for Canaanite. But the connections are far more explicit than I've told you so far, and we're going to dive into those right now. See, the root for the ethnic label Agagite is from the Amalekite king Agag, who we meet first in 1 Samuel 15 as a rival of King Saul, and whose capture is the reason for Saul's downfall and for the Lord taking away the kingdom of Israel from him. The basic implication of this is that because Saul failed to utterly destroy the Amalekites and their king as the Lord commanded, because he spared Agag and his livestock and the riches, this line has continued to trouble the chosen people even into the post-exilic period when the nation of Amal Amalek no longer exists. And if you still aren't convinced that this is what the author is trying to communicate, Go back to chapter 2, when we meet Mordecai, and see how he is introduced to us. The word says this, Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, uh, son of Shimei, the son of Kish. Do you remember in scripture who else was from the tribe of Gen Benjamin and was a son of Kish? Let me refresh your memory with a little scripture here. There was a Benjamite a man of standing whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphia of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul, a handsome and young as a man could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. You see the connection? And it's not just this internal textual connection that makes this clear about Mordecai. But the tradition of Purim, which many scholars believe this story was written in part as an explanation of and an origin story for. The, the tradition of Purim speaks explicitly about the connections of Israel's history with the Amalekites to this story as well. In the synagogue reading on the Sabbath before the start of Purim, the reading is always 1 Samuel 15, which we've already looked at, and then Deuteronomy 25, verses 17 to 19, which says this, Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. When the Lord your God gives you rest from your enemies, from all the enemies around you in the land he's giving you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. And then on the morning of Purim, the reading is the battle of this, that this warning refers to in Exodus 17, 8 to 16. You see, it's clear from the history and traditions of the Jewish people that there is a deep connection between Haman and Agag, just as there is between Mordecai and Saul, and thus between Israel and her ancient enemies. And so, what you have in this story is an egotistical man in the king of Persia's court who fancies himself to be like Xerxes, and you have a descendant and representative of one of Israel's ancient enemies, along with a protagonist with a deep connection to that particular enemy in his own family line. 
you can see why these two men, from a narrative perspective, absolutely had to come into conflict with each other. Haman's whole purpose in this story is to tie up the loose ends of Saul's failure to deal appropriately with Agag. Yes, Samuel may have taken the initiative at the end of 1 Kings 15 to slay the Amalekite king, but Saul's sin was not atoned for. By setting up Haman as a foil for Mordecai, that ancient wrong now has a chance to be righted at the closure of the Old Testament, and Benjamin's shame can now be undone. The events of the book of Esther may be the latest chronological event in the entire Old Testament canon, but that doesn't mean it is not very concerned with things that happened far earlier in Israel's history. This, I believe, is why Haman does what he does. But if that is the case, then what can we learn from Haman's treachery? What does this story that was so relevant to the com community it was written to say to us today? Well, you know the drill. Before that, we need to deal with the offering. So go ahead and pull out your debit cards, your checkbooks, or your smartphones, and I'll be back in a few minutes with the application of this message. Good morning. My name is Darlene Ring, and I'm one of the elders at the Bridge Church. I'd like to take a moment to speak to you about the offering. At the Bridge Church, we teach that giving, which honors God, is always three things, priority, proportional, and progressive. This morning, I would like to speak to you about the second value. Giving ought to be proportional. Let's be frank. Not everyone's lifestyle is the same. Some of us live lives of comfort and abundance, and some of us are barely scraping by. Some of us earn six-figure salaries, and some of us rely on the social safety net to make ends meet. God is not oblivious to this fact. It has been a reality since the dawn of civilization, and in, in His mercy He doesn't ask us to give to Him out of what we don't have, but from what we do. There is a great story in the Gospels about a poor widow who comes to the temple to worship God and puts a paltry sum in the offering. It's the sort of amount that many of us might be embarrassed about if giving in our context, but it represents the best that she has in this story. God looks on her offering with delight because it was proportional to what he had given her. What Jesus asks of us is no different. How much has God blessed you with? Is it a little or is it a lot? Does your offering match that reality? This is what we mean when we say that giving ought to be proportional. If you'd like to give today, there are a number of ways that you can do so, most of which are on the screen right now. Give out of what God has given you, and as you do, know that God receives your offering with joy. So again, we ask, what's the point? Again, the book of Esther intrinsically resists any sort of didactic reading that seeks to squeeze a neat three-point application out of every chunk of text. To see the point of this chapter, and, and consequently the character of Haman as a whole, you need to actually step back from the text today and see the bigger picture of what's going on in the broader story. In the broader story, Haman is two things simultaneously. As I said in week one, he is an over-the-top, mustache-twirling villain a la Dr. Evil. And as I explained just a few minutes ago, he is also the incarnation of one of Israel's oldest enemies and the fruit of the tribe of Benjamin's biggest failure. And as the embodiment of these two ideas, he is an existential threat not only to Mordecai as a person and the Jews in Susa, but to the entire diaspora in the Persian world. Haman's narrative arc is therefore both silly and serious all at the same time, and that is what makes him so fascinating to me. But if we can take all of that and hold these two seemingly contradictory truths in constructive tension, then I think we can, in fact, draw some meaningful applications out of his story, if, that is, we are willing to do the work. I am. Are you? All right. 
There are two main things that Haman's story teaches us, I believe. The first is this. The things that we leave undone in life have a way of coming back to trouble us. Saul and Agag eventually becomes Mordecai and Haman. The author draws a direct line between these two pairs of enemies and a direct correlation between Saul's failure and Haman's plot. If Saul had dealt with Agag the way the Lord commanded him to, there is a good chance that we wouldn't have the story of Esther at all. Disobedience today leads to trouble tomorrow. Unresolved matters from our past can lead to conflicts in our future. There is a reason that Jesus exhorts us not to let the sun go down on our anger and to seek reconciliation right away when we wrong someone or are wronged by someone. Editor Chris here. Uh, I'm interrupting Pastor Chris just to make a little bit of a correction. Uh, I said Jesus says don't let the sun go down on your anger. Of course, anybody who knows their Bibles knows that's actually Paul in Ephesians chapter 4. My bad, in the heat of the moment, you know, I assume that everything in the Bible indirectly was said by Jesus. But just to be clear, that's Ephesians 4, 26. Sorry. Because the failure to do so can have long-lasting, even generational consequences for us and others. And friends, we all know the stories. Many of us have lived them or are living them. Some hurt inflicted by one family member to another in generations that preceded you have ruptured family unity even into your day or your children's days. Many of us are estranged from people that we should be close to because of things that our parents or grandparents have done in their generation. The past rarely stays in the past, but it almost always seeps into the present like an oil stain on a wall that you can't hide no matter how many coats of paint you cover it with. In the same way, the conflicts that you are engaged in today, if not dealt with in a godly manner, with an effort towards resolution and reconciliation, will continue to act as septic wounds in your soul that at a bare minimum, will hamper your emotional health and well-being, and worse than that, could easily spread to other relationships and cause discord in your wider family or community. I mean, you can sweep things under the rug, but as any parent knows, you will still feel the Cheerios crunching under your feet when you step on them. Problems don't go away just by ignoring them. And we see this as an exaggerated example in the plot of Haman's life. And then second, when we look at this story, we see a warning, and a warning that entitlement is a dangerous disposition. See, when we believe that we are entitled to something, we tend to be defensive and combative about not getting that thing. And we are prone, as a result, to disproportionate overreaction in response to it. Haman is a comically entitled individual. Mordecai failing to bow down to him was not some great offense that jeopardized the order of the city or the kingdom. It was a slight, yes, but not one which warranted his zealous rage. And yet Haman felt entitled to the honor that he was denied, and as such a mild offense became an act of war. Friends, let me be honest with you today. We all have entitlement problems. We may or may not be self-aware enough to admit them, but we all have them. We believe that we are entitled to certain things. And when we come into circumstances where we are denied those things that we believe we are entitled to, dangerous things happen in our soul. Let's talk, for example, about the issues of rights. In Western democracies the world over, there is nothing more sacred than an individual's rights. The right to freedom of expression, the right to freedom of conscience, the right to freedom of choice, the right to pursue prosperity. These rights are enshrined in law in most Western countries in various ways. The USA probably has the most famous and strongest language calling some of their core rights inalienable, which means they cannot be contravened or taken away. But most democracies balance those individual rights in some way against the collective good. In Canada, for example, we've all heard in recent talk about Section 1 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which says this, 
The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it, subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. It then goes on at, at, at ad nauseum to describe how that sort of amelioration of individual liberties can be tested, but the point is it sets out limits. But even with these caveats, the emphasis in our legal code is still on the rights that individuals are entitled to. Entitlement, therefore, is enshrined in our highest laws as something good. And yet, time and time again, Scripture paints a different picture. Not one of entitlement, but of obligation. According to the Bible, we have no rights. We live and move and breathe by the grace of a benevolent Creator who allows us to exist simply because He loves us. We live at the mercy of a righteous and perfect God who has not destroyed us in our wickedness, but instead gave His one and only Son as a sacrifice for our iniquities, for the wrong things we have done just because He loves us. We exist at His pleasure, and as such, there is nothing we can say that we are entitled to. Rather, the language of the Bible is language of obligation. To love the Lord our God with your heart and soul and mind and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Nothing else beyond that obligation belongs to us. Everything we have is a gift, and yet you talk to a lot of Christians these days, particularly people who identify, as we do, as evangelicals, and you will get no sense of gratitude or humility, but rather angry entitlement about their rights. If the story of Haman tells us nothing else, it should be a painful revelation about what such attitudes of entitlement lead to. And then as a bonus application, you could probably say that if you're plotting a grisly death for your nemesis, don't leave the room and give them an opportunity to escape. I mean, this is where Haman jumps the proverbial shark with lasers and goes full Dr. Evil. But none of you, I imagine, are plotting your enemy's demise in such a convoluted fashion, right? Right? In summary, don't be a Haman. Don't be evil. Even if you've earned a doctorate in it. Mr. Evil. Dr. Evil. I didn't spend six years in evil medical school to be called Mr. Thank you very much. Let's pray.